Okay, so trying again. Um, we talked before about hypothesis tests and confidence intervals when we have two independent samples. Today we're going to talk about hypothesis tests and confidence intervals when we have dependent samples. So you guys should have an example, but before that we're going to talk about a few, few things. Um, one thing that you need to be able to do after today is determine whether or not the samples are dependent or independent and which process to use. The process that we've done before or the process that we're learning today. Um, yeah, some other things, so we're going to go on. Okay. So this is what we learned before. We learned a two sample test or interval for the difference in means. Um, the whole back of this page, so page 24 is blank. Don't write super big. But two samples, so what we learned before, is used when the samples are independent. <coughs> Matched pairs, so this is what we're learning today, is when the samples are dependent or paired. So some typical pairings is they're going to use the same group and measure before or after a treatment. So the example we're going to do today is there's a bunch of people who are going through a, an education program. So they get a test before the program, they get a test after the program, we want to know did the program help them score better. Do you guys want to just write and then me talk? Yeah. yeah. Probably not listening. Are we almost done writing? No. Okay. So there are three ways that typically we pair. Like I said, the first one is measuring before and after. So you're going to take the same group of subjects, you're going to give them a pretest, they're going to do whatever the treatment is, and then you're going to give them a post test. In that case, you have two samples, the pretest and the post test, but they're dependent because you use the same people twice. Another way to pair is naturally occurring pairs like twins or husband and wife. The way that it works in this case is if you take twins, one twin gets one treatment, the other twin gets the other treatment. You're going to have to randomly determine who gets what treatment. Um, husband and wife, same thing. Husband gets one treatment, wife gets the other treatment. You're going to randomize which gets which. Um, I don't know if you guys remember this from maybe chapter two. Do you guys remember the example we did with boots, weatherproofing boots? Kind of. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and you they were comparing two different boot treatments. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, so that would be an example of matched pairs. Because one of the examples that they did, or one of the designs that they did, was that each person gets both treatments. Do you remember that? One foot gets one treatment, the other foot gets the other treatment. Mm -hmm. Okay, those are dependent samples, though. Because each person is included in both samples. Okay, so you want to pair on factors that might obscure the difference between two populations of interest. So something, you want to reduce variability. Um, so basically you're going, to you're going to pair based on confounding variables. So you're going to match on variables that, affect the that could affect the response but are not actually the response itself. So, for example, let's say we want to 
we want to investigate the height that people can jump at. Like uh, how high you can jump. What might affect how high you can jump? Your shoe type that you're wearing, yeah. Your muscle tone, maybe your initial height. We realize all those might affect. Okay, so we might decide to pair based on your initial height. So the way that that's going to work is I'm going to line all of you guys up, tallest to shortest. I'm going to pick the two tallest people. That's one pair. So within those two tallest people, one person gets one treatment and the other person gets the other treatment. Let's say we're comparing two shoe types or something like that. So one person would get one shoe type, the other person would get the other shoe type. Then I would go to the next pair, the second pair of tallest people. Randomly determine one gets one shoe type, one gets the other shoe type. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes? Okay. What is the response variable in that case? What am I investigating? The jump height. The jump height, right? So you're going to put on a pair of shoes and see how high you can jump. So what I'm not going to do is pair based on how high you can jump. That's what I'm studying. Um, and then you want to make sure that you match before you collect data. So you can't collect data, match people, and then like do your analysis. You have to match before you collect data. Uh, the whole point of doing this matching is that variability in pairing is lower because the measurements in the pair, pair tend to be similar. So we're trying to decrease variability. Measurements in the pair tend to be similar, so we're going to decrease variability. Um, it screens out the effects of extraneous variables. So these extraneous variables could end up uh, obscuring differences between, between the two treatments. So if we don't pair, in some cases, we might end up failing to reject because the extraneous variables are, are affecting the response and we didn't control for them. Questions? No? Can we keep going? Yeah? Okay. Um, okay. So this is the example on page 23. It says the table below gives the pre test and post test scores on the MLA listening test in Spanish for 20 high school Spanish teachers who, attend, who attended an intensive summer course in Spanish. At the bottom, we hope to show that attending the institute improves listening skills. Carry out a full hypothesis test. Okay, like before, we're not going to carry out the full test. I'm just going to show you the parts that are different. Um, okay. In the interest of time, I'm going to show you formulas, but I probably won't show you the calculator stuff until Monday. Is that okay? Yeah? Super sure. So first thing that's different, well first of all, how do you know that this is matched pairs? So the new stuff and not what we did before. Pre-test and post-test. It's the same subjects, the same 20 teachers, pre-test and post-test. Okay, P is going to be different this time. And P, the symbol is mu sub D. So this is going to be the population mean score difference. Okay, and then you tell, need to tell me which way you subtracted. So I think it makes mo more sense to do post-test minus pre-test. You don't have to, but think that makes the most sense. Okay, so we're going to have the null and the alternative. Your null is generally going to be that mu d equals zero. So generally there's no difference in pretest and post-test scores. For all our alternative, we want to see if the Summer Institute improves listening skills. If we improved listening skills, 
post-test minus pre-test should be greater than zero. Okay, assumptions. First one, instead of independent random samples, you want to know do we have paired? <coughs> uh, I'm going to write it two different ways. Okay, do we have paired samples? Are they independent? Sorry, not independent. What did I mean? Random. <laughs> yeah, sorry. And then, do we have approximately normal sampling distribution? Okay, here's the part that's tricky. In P, you only have one variable that you define, mu d. So we are only talking about one sample. So you need to see if, the, if we have an approximately normal sampling distribution, only one of them. You are looking at the sampling distribution of the differences. Not actually of the pretest and the post-test, but of the differences. So in this case, we can't use the central limit theorem because our sample size is 20. We don't know that the population is normal, so we would have to graph. Um, we would have to graph the sample. You guys have the graph on page 23. So you have a graph of the pretest, you have a graph of the post-test, and you have a graph of the differences. Does that difference? That uh, dot plot of the differences show extreme skewness or outliers? I'd say probably not, no. So we can say that that assumption is met. For the N, not much is going to change except for the name. This is called a mashed pairs. hypothesis test for population mean difference or you can just call it a matched pairs hypothesis test you still have to say alpha you still have to say the table um, you still have to say degrees of freedom with matched pairs you can still have T or Z In this case I didn't tell you the population standard deviation so we're going to use T um, because these are matched, do you guys realize that both samples are going to be the same size? Yeah. So by T, I meant degrees of freedom. So your degrees of freedom is always going to be n minus 1. So in this case, we're going to use 19 degrees of freedom. Can I erase all this? Yeah. Okay. Mm, T? Okay, so we're going to use T because we don't know the population standard deviation. This is going to be X bar D minus mu D all over S sub D divided by root N. Okay, that D just emphasizes that you have to look at the sample of differences. You can't look at the pretest sample and the post-test sample. It has to be the sample of differences. So if you guys look at the descriptive statistics part that you have on page 23, it has the pretest information, the post-test information, and it has the difference information. Okay, based on that, what is your X bar D? Mm -hmm. 1.45. 1.45. Mu sub D, that comes from your null, so that's just zero. The standard deviation of the differences is 3.203. And then I'm going to divide by the square root of 20. I have no idea what that value actually is. Somebody do it real quick. Please. Point oh two. Wow, we were really <laughs> close. Thank you, Camila. Okay, 2.02. 2 
It's upper tailed, so I'm going to do the probability that t is greater than or equal to 2.02, and that's going to give me some, some value. Is this not too bad? No. I mean, really, nothing has changed. Does this remind you of anything? More hypothesis. We've done this hypothesis test before. No? No idea? Yeah. Yeah. You have another formula that looks something like this? Uh, oh. We've done that formula before? Yeah. That's just for one mean. All I did was add D. Um, okay, and then your conclusion would be the same, finding the p-value is going to be the same. Are we okay if we don't actually write all of that stuff? Perfect. Okay, because I do want to show you how to do this in the calculator. It's different in the calculator. So right now, can you put all the pre-tests in list one and all the post-tests in list two? So anybody that doesn't have a calculator, or they're just dead. Oh. You said to put all of those tests in Put pre-tests in list one, post-tests in list two. Okay, it is very important that you go in the correct order. So don't go out of order. We all have that? Yeah? Okay. So like I said before, you don't care about pre-test and post-test, you care about the difference. So what I want you to do right now is do list two, which is post-test, minus list one, which is pre-test, and store it in list three. Did we do that? Yes? Now you're going to do everything with list three. So for example, calculate the one bar stats of list three. You should get this mean and that standard deviation. If I asked you to do a box plot, you would do the box plot of list three. You're only going to use list three. You're only going to use the differences. Is that clear? Yes? This shouldn't be too different, so I know that I haven't done a whole lot on the board, but it should be pretty much the same as what we've been doing. Do we have any questions? Okay, to check your answer on the calculator, hit stat, <coughs> go over to tests, and you are just doing a t-test. You have the data, mu sub zero is zero, and then the list is list three. Was ours upper tail or lower tail? Upper tail, upper tail, right? And then hit calculate. And you should get a p-value of 0 0.0286, and also a t-value of 2.02 like we got before. Yeah? Okay, so in general, what do we believe about this summer institute? Yeah. Does it improve listening skills, yes or no? Yeah. yeah. Are you guys with me? Yeah. Um, wait, yes. 
Yeah, we want to know, does it attending the institute improve listening skills? We would say yes, we believe that attending the institute improves listening skills because the post-test is higher than the pre-test. Now, just for fun, I want us to see what would happen if we did this test not being matched pairs, if we just did it as a two sample. So hit staff, go to tests, this time do a two sample t-test with list one and list two, and do greater than. Oh, I'm sorry, not greater than. Okay, we, we got to think about this. We have list one and list two. List two is our post-test, and list one is our pre-test. So you're going to have to do L2 and L1, and then do greater than. should get a p-value of 0.177. Do we? Okay, so if we hadn't done this as matched pairs, instead if we had done a two sample test, what would we have concluded? That the listening skills were not improved after the, the Summer Institute. Okay, you guys look like you're about to die. Do we have any questions? Die slash fall asleep, one of the two. Why was the homework worth so much? Because it was 60 points. It's not actually going to be worth 60 points. I took it out of 30 points instead. Okay. 